When you move through the world every day, at work or on the street, as a parent or talking to strangers at the bus stop, who do you carry with you? Your mom or dad? Your chosen family? Mentors? Political ancestors? Maybe you carry the version of yourself that you hope to meet soon. The you that is being made and remade in all your small choices. So we have a stairwell that actually has like some historical leaders. We have Gaspar Yanga, Denmark, Vesey, Zapata, Patri, Hejera, Harriet Tubman, Fred Hampton, Celia Sanchez, Walter Rodney, Harold Washington, and the top one is Angela Davis. No matter how many stairs that you take, just always think back and look back to the leaders that also took those steps as well with you. I'm Eve Ewing, and this is Guaranteed, the podcast where we find out what happens when regular people around my sweet home, Chicago, receive direct cash assistance, guaranteed income. We learn about the choices people make, the dreams they pursue, and the impossible things that become a little more possible when folks get a little bit of money, guaranteed. Our guest today is Sharif. Sharif is receiving guaranteed income through a program specially designed for people who've been formerly incarcerated or involved in the criminal legal system. Sharif talks about fatherhood, about wrestling, literally and figuratively, and about becoming an abolitionist. We also get to that most thorniest of guaranteed income controversies. What happens if people use the money to buy Jordans? Will the world actually end? Let's find out. Here's Sharif. My name is Sharif. Um, I go by the greatest, not with T-H-E, but with D-A. You know what I'm saying? And uh, what brings joy in my life is my kids uh, being an active father. And um, by having the opportunity to uh, be behind 26 in California, the lives that's behind those walls, you feel me? They motivate me to become who I need to be, to strive to get them free. Uh, My father always been supportive, you know what I'm saying? Especially when it came towards sports or anything dealing with his kids being outside. And that was a, a touching stone for me personally because of a lot of other young individuals. They don't have their father in their life, you know what I'm saying? So I try to shine bright on that as much as possible. What's 11 of us, you feel me? And I'm the sixth child. We always play football with no gear. And we always used to wrestle too. So I, I really love family. I, I'm, a, I'm the type that's going to really vouch when it comes to his family. What was high school like for you? What were you what were you into? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? So I, I was affiliated um, in my high school and through my upbringings, I always wanted to be a part of something. And like I said, I was affiliated. So I was mainly actively fighting in high school. I was listening because my mother always told us she ain't raising no clown. She was like heavy on education. It was just really just waking up every morning. Hey, my, my mother's mouth, you know what I'm saying? Get up, go to school, unless we ain't suspended. But she still came to the school to my kids is not for to be uh, suspended from school when they supposed to be learning education. She was like really against that little suspension stuff. So they brought it into the in-school suspension. And then um, along with that, I couldn't play really basketball because of it was around the same season of uh, wrestling. Okay, so I am very ignorant about like real wrestling like for real for real wrestling like I know like TV wrestling but can you teach me a little bit about like what is it like to wrestle on a team how does a wrestling match work are there like positions like there's positions in a team sport like just kind of you know can you put me on wrestling a little bit respect definitely so pretty much um we had to have our grades up you know what I'm saying and as much as I was like actively doing what I was doing I was still fortunate to be still on a uh, wrestling team but to get to the point on wrestling, it was like 15 of us. And it's all dependent. You got a weight class. And whatever your weight class is, you'll wrestle that weight class. And I was at 145. And the most that I ever wrestled was like a 155, 160. I was heavy on my high school time, especially doing, um, uh, what was it called? Hip toss. I was doing the hip toss. The hip toss is pretty much where you grab them and you kind of put your, your right arm over the head. And then you put your left hand onto like the left arm. 
and I, I have my hand on them. And as I have my hand on them, I kind of like twist my right hip and then I'll just sling them. You feel me? That, that was my signature move. Yeah. What kind of headspace did you have to be in? Like, you know, did you have a certain rituals or how would, when you about to go out and do this match? Cause it's very like, it seems very intense to me. It's just you against one other person, you know, like it seems like you really have to get your mind right. So what kind of headspace would you be in? How would you do that? My mind was really clear. I'm like the ant person. You know what I'm saying? I'm more excited when it comes to people. But when it comes to that Matt and me and you, I'm even more even geek because I'm testing your strength and you testing my strength. And it's really all up to you personally. You can go in there on however defensive, however, whatever's on your mind. But mine was always on a, a winning mode. I'm going to come in, get you over with. That's how I'm coming. It was this uh, one wrestling match. It was like second before the actual final. He was like a tall, lengthy dude, and it was kind of hard to kind of do a hip toss, you know what I'm saying, to the lengthy brother. Um, we was like on the a, on a floor, and just being able to get him on that ground personally, I think that was like the hardest one because, again, he was tall and lengthy. But the, the last one, which was the one where I came in first place at, I was out of breath. I was really out of breath. My coach was he- heavy on like staying in shape pretty much, and I was out of it. He was out of it. I was out of it. We did too much to each other. We we tossed each other. Like we was just going at it back and forth. And we'd last the whole three matches. That last one, I was on the ground. My coach is yelling, get up, get up, you know, get up, get up. I'm like, I'm about to give up. You know, I'm about to really give up. My other coach was Pam. She's like, Sharif, get up, get up. You have five seconds or 10 seconds, whatever was left on the clock. Get up. I'm like, oh. I had to make it work. I put that strength in and all honesty, I got up. And as I was getting up, the brother was on my leg. Like, you know how a baby, like, hold on to your leg? Yeah, he was He was like holding on to my leg because I'm trying to, like, move, like, the way he was on me. And then all of a sudden, I got up out of it. And then that's when the ring ended. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, everybody went crazy. So did you win? Yeah, I won that day, yeah. Tell me about your coaches. You mentioned Pam and who was your other coach. Were they important to you in your life? Coach Pam and Coach Tony. He was really um, striving for me while I was in wrestling throughout my whole four years of uh, wrestling. Um, he always wanted me to be a part of the team. He let me actually become the the leader, actually, even though we had scenes on the team. But he let me, like, no, let him be the leader. And I was like a the hype man, too. You know, one of the things you mentioned was that you know, you were affiliated in high school, the coaches, you know, I assume that they knew that, but they were still letting you wrestle. Why do you think that that was important to them? Why do you think they made that decision? The last thing my coach wanted was something happening to me. But him being able to watch me while I was doing what I was doing was more enjoyment for him. I was always excited every time I came in to practice, you feel me? My mind is on this specific thing right now where I'm here. And I'm actually... I'm still in contact with most of the people that was on a wrestling team, only off the strength. We built that bond, and that bond will always stay tight. They're like another people that seen the things I was doing and then how I overcame. Are you comfortable with me asking you a couple questions about that? I'm all ears. You know, something you said earlier that I think was very powerful is, you know, you wanted to be part of something bigger, you know, and I could see that also with you as a wrestler. You know, do you feel like you were searching for something and did you find what you were searching for? Mm, it's deep. Yes, experience. I needed experience. My family always said not to be affiliated. It was one conversation that my mother always had. She said, uh, why did I want to join the game? I told her my personal reason. And it was to because I was tired of them telling me not to be that when I wanted to be that. It was rubbing me the wrong way. And when I became what I was, they were still supportive, but my mother was always judging off of the past experience she had with my pops, I say. It's clear you respect a lot what your mother wanted for you. But you said, hey, you know, I want to be this other thing. I want to do this other thing. What do you think that was about? What did, what was it that you that you wanted? Again, experience. I wanted that experience through my journey. I didn't want to pass on that same thing because what, what I was told rather than what I actually know. And I can actually speak on something I actually know of rather than what I was told. You wanted to see for yourselves what was what. Exactly. I needed my hands on everything. 
what are some of those experiences that that you gained in those years that you carry with you now? My interactions with the police, um, even when they kept catching on to our movements, our names, they kept saying our names, and just being inside. Uh, I spent a half a year in a uh, juvenile detention center. I was accused of something that I didn't do. I got found not guilty February 14th. I consider my freedom day. So every year, you everybody's celebrating Valentine's Day and you celebrating your own freedom on that day? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was this year when I got found not guilty. Congratulations. Thanks. What was your experience like in the juvenile detention? And, and we'll talk about that. Then I want to think a little bit about 26 in California. But what was your experience like in juvenile detention? And what was that like for you? I guess just seeing other young people that was in there with me fighting the same situation, maybe through a different stroke, you know what I'm saying? And the CEOs, some was cool, some was like assholes, you know what I'm saying? And, and it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, especially because the majority of them was our people that looked like us. They always said, um, you will never be my kid because if you was my kid, my kid won't be in this situation. Mm. Why would they say that? Like, would they just kind of say that out the blue or would you ever say to them like, I could be your kid, or they they would just say out the blue, like I, my kid would never be in here, unprompted. Yeah, it's always always out of the blue. Anything that we do, like little minor thing, you know what I'm saying? Oh, my kid would never do this, but especially if we talk. They ain't like us talking back to them. By them saying that all the time, it seems like that was on their heart. Because otherwise, why would you say that? You know, like why would you feel the need to say that? Oh, you would never be my kid. Like it's almost like it's something that was preoccupying them. Yeah. Definitely. And I think it's their job. Well, that wasn't their job to say what they said, but it was like by them have to constantly wake up to see our face consistently. They were tired of doing it. And they kind of, it was on their sleeve, you feel me? They really didn't want to wake up to come and take care of somebody else's kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Does that impact the way that you approach dealing with your own kids? Definitely. I vouch for my kids. Like, I don't like when they keep their mouth closed. Like, I want you to speak. I want you to speak when... You don't know an answer to something. I want you to speak when you say you need assistance with something. You know what I'm saying? I'm 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 all ears when you leave my presence. I want you to speak to anybody that either if you like it or you don't like it. You know what I'm saying? I want you to speak when you come back in front of me. You tell me whatever that that you didn't like or did like. You feel me? I will stand on what my kids tell me. At the beginning of the conversation, you said you know the folks that you met when you were at 26 in California that you you really carry their voices with you, that you carry their experiences with you every day. So yeah, when I was in uh, 26 of Cali, I was, I was fighting that situation, which was a body. And by being locked up, you know what I'm saying, I've made different faces in different situations. I'm just seeing them fighting a situation. Either they, they got out, came back in, or whatever it is, you know what I'm saying? It kind of just told me, like, don't be them, be you. I had to learn from what they were going through. And then I know not to do what they did. And just hearing their conversations, you know what I'm saying, mainly, it's like it came to my attention of like, man, my people's in, like they going through it. I felt like we was invisible. As every car kept riding past, like I was close to the window, I felt like I kept seeing cars ride past, you know what I'm saying? Not one car that I felt in that time frame stopped their car, raised their hand, you know what I'm saying, just to acknowledge our existence while being behind those walls. And then as hearing my, my peoples on the phone talking to their peoples, it kind of broke me down. Like, it just opened up my eyes. Like, I cannot let my peoples fail. You feel me? While they inside here, I got to strive for them to get them out. And whatever way, I'm going to do it. Were you able to, to stay connected as a parent um, during that time? Yeah. Um, shout out to my, my girl. Yeah, she definitely held me down. Um, she kept bringing my kids. I didn't want them to. But I'm not a type of person that will block the view what my kids need to see. Like, this is reality. We're going to call truth for what truth is. I still felt bad, you know what I'm saying, off the strength. It was like, like, it wasn't even 15 minutes I was actually getting to spend time with my kids. You know what I'm saying? It was probably like 10 minutes, maybe less, all depending on how fast or how, how they rushing to kind of get the visitors in and get them out. They, they was on a time frame. You feel me? We wasn't. We clocking our time because you're not for the players with our time. But again, that's another thing on authority. So they had their authority and they were using their authority however they used their authority. So I was getting educated through all angles. Abolitionists. I'm trying to, not going to say trying. 
I'm going to close these prisons down and I'm going to build as much inspiration, motivation, and encouragement and confidence to my peoples against the system, against the hierarchies that's really against the people. You feel me? So you were in Cook County for 15 months, but you hadn't had a trial. Nope. Through that 15 months, my case was still getting continued. So I waited like I think a year to get a bond because of the judge I had. And again, it was one of my peoples or our peoples, you feel me, that kind of still rubbed me the wrong way. My lawyer shot for um, a $35,000 cash bond. And the judge, which one of our peoples, ended up increasing the 35000 to 70000 And I pretty much had to sit. Fortunately, uh, that following year of 2020, the COVID hit. This was like one of the critique moments that kind of I really value off the strength of. I actually had hope that they was going to let all of us out of the jail because of the COVID. You know what I'm saying? And the way how the outbreak was breaking out. That's something I would have personally been thoughtful of doing. But I ain't them. And the fact that my people was still was, was still in there, I was just one out of a million or a thousands of them that was in there. My my lawyer, I think it was around May 12th or May 13th, I ended up losing my father. I'm so sorry to hear that. It's all love. Appreciate it. Respect. That wasn't a booster to get me out, but that was like a, also an egg on to the reason he needs to be home. Also with my kids, also with the community that I built relationship with. And again, when she shot for another bond reduction, um, it wasn't with my judge, it was with another judge. They gave me a 35000 cash bond, and I bonded out that same day. With shout out to Chicago Bond Fund. I just want to throw that out there. Yes. Shout out to Chicago Bond Fund. You feel me? So just to be like extra clear, all those other months that you were locked up, you had not been convicted of a crime, right? So the difference between you being with your kids, with your family, was not innocence or guilt. The difference was money. Is that correct? Yes. What inspired you to want to participate in the Guaranteed Income um, program? So after I bonded out, I was not expecting this. They put me on some goofy ass house arrest, blew my mind. I was on house arrest for like two years, nine months, and 25 days. You know what I'm saying? And I never left the crib throughout 2020 to 2021, 2022. You got an ankle bracelet? Yeah. And I'm, I don't value money because I see what I can do. You know what I'm saying? The only thing that kind of struck me was that my kids needed something, whatever that, that I couldn't get them. They needed it. I wasn't able to actually go out and get it. You know what I'm saying? And that kind of bothered me the wrong way. I see this guaranteed income. They say it's for people that's incarcerated. You know what I'm saying? And uh, predominantly for people that's from the West Side. And once I heard it, psh, I was like, hell yeah, sign me up. You feel me? I was thirsty. You feel me? It's like $500 guaranteed every month. You ain't got to tell me twice. It was November of 2022. I think it was. I'm geek for my kids. They don't know it, but I'm geek for, you know what I'm saying? Like, I got you. Your father been in the crib with y'all every day. You know what I'm saying? So I want to see y'all Christmas and whatever else that's needed for y'all to be what y'all need. When I got applied for it, I got a phone call probably within like a week. No bullshit. So I was like, oh, it's up. It's lit. You got to tell me twice. Whatever you need me to do, I got you. I'm going to try to be there. But um, they was really considerate of me being on house arrest. But yeah, luckily. It was around Thanksgiving too. That's crazy. It was around Thanksgiving. I was I was able to provide, put food on the table, and at Christmas, Christmas was heavy. So I never spent two thousand dollars on Christmas stuff, and I really saved that that money. I kept my promise of using that five hundred dollars specifically for the kids, specifically anything for the household, but mainly for the kids. Truthfully, what are some of the everyday things that you know that your kids need that cost a lot of money? Clothes is definitely one of them. As my kids was growing, I ain't going to lie to you. I was brought up wearing pro wings, you know what I'm saying? And I felt out of ordinary or whatever you want to consider um, because all the other ones had Jordans and all that stuff. Yeah, I never had Jordans either. (laughs) See what I'm saying? I bought my first pair of Jordans when I was uh, 29 years old and I cried. (laughs) No, that's real. For real. Every time. But... I still won't try to go out my way to kind of get shoes because of that reason. You know what I'm saying? And just seeing my kids happy with some actual outfits on and with some shoes that I know I couldn't really get when I was younger, trying to make sure my kids be situated 
even if it was just momentarily, I'm still cool with it. You know what I'm saying? One of the things that people say when they critique these type of programs is like, people are going to waste the money. People are going to spend it on goofy things. You know, um, people are going to spend it on drugs. People are going to, you know, whatever. What would you say to those people in response? That's their money. Let them do what they as please. You know what I'm saying? And we is not them. So why criticize something that you may already have and that the others don't got? You know what I'm saying? And just to top it off, like, it's just five hundred dollars. You feel me? What is it to a big dog that really making money? You know what I'm saying? Is you gonna really toss that money down and give it out of your hand consistently to these people that really don't got it? Right. Even like the Jordans thing. Like, I think that a lot of times black people they'll critique Jordan specifically, right? And they'll say like, "That's a waste of money. That's a bad use of money." But the flip side is, like you said, if you ain't ever had something that kind of makes you feel special or kind of makes you feel good. It's like, don't we deserve to feel good for a little bit? You know, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? When you hear people kind of critiquing like the Jordans thing? Mm. I think that kind of goes back to the confidence. Like you said, it makes them feel good. You know what I'm saying? And also makes them feel confident. It's like now that they got one thing, they also can strive to get the next. And to criticize somebody on that, it's like stopping their belief. You'll never want to block a passage of somebody Saying like th- if they striving just to get Jordans, let them strive to get Jordans. We're talking a little bit about how this impacts your kids, but in turn, how does it impact your view of yourself as a father to know that you can provide these things? Like, what does that do for you? I got to throw this out there. I was taken away from my kid for that 15 months. You feel me? I wasn't out there doing goofy stuff. You feel me? Um, I was taken away. So I'm, I'm going to blame the system for taking me away from my kid. But the brighter side to it, you know what I'm saying? I can't hold the system accountable, you know what I'm saying? But I got to be accountable because I was going for those 15 months. So as a as a father, I was kept my promise of I'm going to be there with y'all every step of the way. I was with my kids 24-7 from sun up, sun down, taking them to circles and ciphers where I was doing my service with. My kids got to be with me, you know what I'm saying? If they can't come, I can't come either being able to actually see what I needed to do for my kids that kind of made me even strive more harder because it's my priority. I'm fortunate because I was in the crib every day. So that $500, you know what I'm saying? I felt like I was actually still doing something for my kids when they, it was like the back burner was your father can go outside, but the, the brighter side was that that guaranteed income came in place for y'all to see that your father was able to get some sort of money from somebody. It makes me very emotional hearing that and also makes me think about you losing your pops and the lessons that he had taught you about confidence and the way that you said that he was there for you. You know, I hear you echoing that and you saying you want to be there for your kids. And I guess I was wondering um, what are some of the ways that your that your pops his words are in your ear these days you know in what ways is his spirit with you these days my pops always said it's to be aware it's to be alive he was just appreciative of him seeing me actually with the kids every day he just always applauded me like son I'm proud of you son I'm proud of you son what are some of the things that that make you proud right now as a father I think they proud of being themselves Are there any questions you have for me or anything that we didn't get to that you feel is important to talk about? True. Um, Do I have any questions? Well, I think you covered everything on my end. Um, I think I probably want to ask the same opposite questions towards you on your (laughs) upbringing, but I don't think we have enough time. So. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm open if if you have a you can pick you want to pick a burning any burning question so I don't, I don't keep you here all day. All respect. I got you. Um I got like probably like two questions for you. Um one okay, of Okay, I'm ready. For sure. One of them is um what is it that you do for your mm-hmm. people? And it got you to do what you do. Oh, what a great question. Well, I try to do something for my people every day. I think sometimes I succeed and sometimes I fail, but I would say I believe that all of us have certain gifts and it's our job to use those gifts in service to our people. 
And so something that I'm good at is I'm a good writer and I'm a good storyteller, I, I believe. And so I try to use every tool that's available to me to tell stories, specifically stories of Black people thriving, um, Black people living different types of lives, and then also like hard stories, like like hard things that have happened in history, hard things about the systems that we're still living with now. Like you said, you know, like prison. I write a lot about schools and education. So like things about mm-hmm. schools that are racist or broken and then like trying to think about how they could be better. Um, mm. So that's kind of like what I try to do in terms of what got me to do that. I think that one of my biggest heroes is Gwendolyn Brooks. She was somebody who always advocated for her people and she like showed up in everyday ways. And then the other thing is like, honestly, the people like you, like, for example, me, you never met before. And like, truly, you taught me a lot today. Like, I believe that just when we just talk to regular people, we learn a lot about how powerful and talented and wise and brilliant, like so many people are just all around us. And that honestly, like motivates me to do what I do, because I just love us a lot. (laughs) I love us. No, I think... You know, I think we're dope. And um, yeah. And then honestly, like, you know, I feel very blessed to do something that makes me happy that I enjoy. I feel like that's a that's a big blessing. So, yeah, that's kind of like what I do. Mm. I dig Thank that. Thank you for that question. No, it's all love. Um, the other one, too, I have for you was um same question to it, like the last one that you asked me. But uh, what is it that your parents told you that still resonate with you as of today? My mother always says, be a door opener, not a gatekeeper. True. Um, And another thing she says is like, be a light bringer. Mm. When you share things with other people, you open the door for other people to come through and be with you. Like it makes everybody better, happier. It makes you happier. It makes the world better, you know? And so like, that's something that I, that I try to keep with me a lot. Yeah. That's something that I keep with me. That's deep. To be a door opener, not a gatekeeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you that. can have that one for free. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would take that. Thanks, Mom. I'm going to let them know I, you gave it to me. Yeah. Throughout our conversation, Sharif traces the web of his network of relationships, his people. There are the people who've helped him and the people who've had his back, the people he feels accountable to and responsible for, people he's directly related to, and people he's never met who he hopes to inspire. One central hub of Sharif's network is the organization Circles and Ciphers, where he goes regularly to stay grounded and stay connected. Producer Daniel and I went up there to visit. It's a beautiful day today, man. Like the sun is out. Everybody's feeling the good energy. Um, Hi, how are you today? Good, good. So this is Circles and Ciphers. Circles and Ciphers is a non-for-profit organization that um, helps young people from incarcerated, anything dealing with the system. The first time I came um, was in 2010. Um, That was when it was a gang conflict that was going on in my high school between two rival gangs and Circles and Cypher came to my high school and we had a conversation amongst masculinity, but it was the majority of just like the difference of each other, sharing space with each other and understanding who we is as people rather than what we are as what we're representing. I don't want my kids to like have like problems with communicating. And the more you speak, the better you'll have a chance of getting what you have on your chest out rather than like constantly isolating yourself. So I want my kids to be more present, social, active around people. And as a kid, you know what I'm saying? Still, they use themselves. They speak what they speak. They feel what they feel. And they feel free. They is the stepping stone, the head stepping stone of what free should be. Sharif's tour ended in the recording space at Circles and Ciphers. It's called, delightfully, Kaba Studios, named to honor our shared friend and mentor, abolitionist writer and thinker, Mariam Kaba. 
So this is the uh, Kaaba studio, and uh, this is where everybody expresses themselves through the lyrics. I, I didn't think I could really do it, you know what I'm saying? But it just once I put the headphones on my ear and I was really tuned out to uh, the song, I really felt, I felt myself, I felt, I felt free. I felt connected to those that, that was here, but not here no more. I still felt it connected towards them. Kaaba Studio is definitely open. Um, you is more than welcome to come to the space. The first, I would definitely recommend coming to the circle first. Um, that way you can get the feeling. So that way when you hit the Kaaba Studios, you have a lot more to say. You even have 10 times more to say of what you felt, what you heard as you came to the space. As Sharif and I spoke, I thought a lot about parallels between the way he talks about fatherhood and the way he talks about abolition. Fatherhood, for him, is a set of parallel journeys. The path his own father set him on and the path he's trying to walk for his kids and with his kids. Abolition, restorative justice, healing after being incarcerated, these are not badges you get to wear and be one and done, slogans on a t-shirt or a box you check off. That stuff is a journey too. And it's clear that Sharif is not on that journey alone. He's carrying the strength inherited from those people who have his back as he walks up those steps. All of us are. We just have to take the time to look around and feel them cheering us on, talking in our ear, saying, get up, get up, get up. Guaranteed is created by Respair Production and Media and me, your host, Eve Ewing, with the support of the Economic Security Project and super mega thanks to Jenna Severson for her assistance. Our producers are Damon Williams, Daniel Kisslinger, and Jeanette Harris-Courts. And our theme music is the song Woof by San Morimoto. Catch you later. Also, I assume that hanging on to somebody's leg like a baby is not a wrestling move. You're not supposed to do that, right?